Okay. So welcome everyone. I can see people are filtering into our uh, Zoom room here. And I'm delighted to say to wrap up Black History Month, we have um, one of my favorite writers. Uh, you know, some historians can be kind of dry <laughs> to read, um, but Graham Hodges, uh, who is the George Dorland Langdon Jr. Professor of History at Colgate University, has written extensively about the Irish and African-American experience. Um, not just the topic he'll talk about today, actually, but going back to the colonial, colonial era, he's analyzed runaway adverts, which talks about sometimes indentured servants and enslaved people running off together. So he has, um, you know, 300 years worth of the interactions between indentured servants and enslaved people or later on um, in, you know, the antebellum era, which we're, he'll kind of focus on today. Black people and Irish people working um, in one of the poorest and roughest neighborhoods in, in the world, the Five Points area. Those of you who are members, we went down last year to see the musical, Graham, I don't know if you got a chance to see it, called uh, Paradise Square. Um, yes, right. It was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that's kind of the era we're going to be looking at today. And welcome. Thank you very much. OK, ready to go? I, we are. I'm spotlighting you. Right, You're thanks, good. <laughs> thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you very again for inviting me. And uh, really, it's wonderful work that you're doing in Albany. Uh, and it really has ramifications well beyond our state's capital. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, to talk about uh, a piece I did some years ago, but which still has quite a little bit of re resonance. Uh, it's called Desirable Companions and Lovers, Irish and African Americans in the Sixth Ward of New York City, which was encompasses the five points that Elizabeth spoke about a moment ago on Paradise Alley. Uh, and this is roughly from in the antebellum period, 1830 up to past the Civil War. Uh, and I start off with a, uh, a reference that I saw in a guidebook, but by a guy named George Foster, one of these many tourist guides that began to appear in the antebellum period. And he was guiding his readers through a midnight tour of the infamous Five Points. Mm -hmm. And he reflected upon the frequency of intermarriage between African-American males and Irish women, uh, whom Foster believed regarded their husbands as desirable companions and lovers. And this is, of course, a very uh, uh, poignant phrase and something that got me going on this because it went against the perceived wisdom that I was taught in graduate school many years ago, uh, continuing through many of the studies of the Five Points and antebellum New York City, which portrayed the Irish and Blacks as implacable foes uh, who were fighting over uh, antagonism over work, uh, just general racism, uh, Irish antagonism towards the possibility of Blacks regaining the suffrage. Um, and so this sort of seemed like an, an immutable uh, racial hostility uh, which then filtered into other areas. Uh, and one of the most important going beyond uh, what I consider to be important, but also many other people consider a local history of New York is the use that the historian David Rodiger made of it uh, in his famous book on wages of whiteness in which he argued that this animosity that Irish felt towards blacks uh, was part of the wages of whiteness uh, and was important in their gradual assimilation into whiteness in the latter part of the 19th century, and the early 20th century. Okay? And that eventually goes through the work of Noel Ignatia into how Jews and Italians, and later in our period, how Asians have become white by expressing racist attitudes towards African-Americans. So you can see uh, that this uh, perceived animosity uh, has a lot of importance for how we as Americans look at our past and even as we perceive our, our, our presence. Okay. Uh, now, much of the work that's been done on African Americans and the Irish in uh, the antebellum period uh, has focused on a series of riots, beginning with 1834 uh, with an, uh, an infamous anti-abolitionist riot uh, through the uh, 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 actors at uh, the uh, dramatic riot in 1847, and then culminating, of course, in the very famous, I uh, should say infamous, draft riot of uh, 1863, in which uh, Irish New Yorkers uh, ransacked the city, uh, burned a number of buildings, including the Colored Orphan Asylum, 
uh, and uh, the black uh, African-American churches and also kill a number of blacks on the street. And so those riots in themselves are indicative of a moment of uh, deep animosity uh, in a time in which uh, it's believed you know, that uh, Irish and African-Americans uh, demonstrated their in implacable foes. But what I thought I would do, and I did this some time ago, and I, I'm glad to see that others uh, have con continued to uh, affirm what I did, uh, was to look at the experiences of ordinary New Yorkers over time, okay? and to see them in very quotidian, pedestrian ways, okay? uh, and also to think about gender and racial context of their relationships, and so therefore move beyond this idea of the wages of whiteness, of this implacable hostility, and, and see if there weren't times and people who got along, uh, who demonstrated what James Oliver Horton, a uh, uh, much missed and late historian, uh, referred to as you know the uh, the familiarity of everyday life, okay? and uh, he argued that places like the Five Points uh, were uh, locales where people lived together. Okay? Now the other thing that I wanted to do, uh, and this perhaps is a well, it is, it's, it's a value, uh, I think, to general audiences, but also to those who studied labor history, uh, is to, to move beyond uh, prototypical studies of labor, of labor history uh, as uh, industrial, okay? to move beyond the, the skilled laborers uh, into uh, more everyday occupations, carting, groceries, tavern keepers, and even to what Karl Marx referred to as the useless trades, which is prostitution. Okay? And there we can see a lot more intermixing okay? uh, beyond this uh, view of irreconcilable racism. Okay? We also have to think about, as Horton did in some of his wonderful essays about New York, uh, to look beyond the divisions within the Irish, that many of them did live in the five points. Okay? Uh, and But more of them, as he pointed out, moved out of there into the Bloomingdale region, which is now the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Uh, and there, because they were segregated from African-Americans who lived in Five Points and then later in the Greenwich Village area, up to uh, what's now called Hell's Kitchen around Lincoln Center, present-day Lincoln Center, and ultimately to Harlem, that that uh, segregation promoted the kind of deep-seated hostility that incurred the draft riots, okay? So uh, back to the five points though, and the sixth ward, this is really the crucible of Irish and black relations uh, for the antebellum period and beyond that. Irish African-Americans have been living there uh, since the 1640s. And since I first studied this, of course, uh, people have found out about the African burial ground and the, the many enslaved people who were buried there, but also free black people. Uh, and their bones were eventually uh, tossed into the East River uh, during the 1840s and 1850s. Uh, eventually, African-American burial grounds uh, moved up to uh, uh, Washington Square Park and then eventually to Harlem. Okay? Uh, but this is an area where uh, African-Americans had lived, the six-foot six ward, along with Irish journeymen, uh, small tradespeople, and carters. Okay. Uh, these are guys who drove uh, two-wheeled carts, and I did a whole book on them if you want to look at them. They're really quite fascinating characters, uh, and they were deeply racist. They, they were able to push through legislation back in the early English era, uh, which forbade free or Black New Yorkers from driving carts, and uh, this is a position akin to uh, driving a pickup truck today. I mean, I could do it. You can probably do it as well. Uh, and it was an easy way uh, to, to pick up income. But the Carters working within a licensed environment, which was still very important in the antebellum period, wanted to restrict outsiders from doing this. And by that, they also not only meant farmers, sailors, uh, people who were transient New Yorkers, but also African-Americans. And so as a result, the trade was pretty rigorously segregated over uh, the next 200 years. It was not until the license period uh, ended in the 1840s that Blacks were able to, to pick up the job. Okay. Uh, now, 
The Five Points area was carved out of the former Delancey Farm. This is a large stretch of land going from present day uh, um, uh, Lower Manhattan all the way up to 14th Street. Okay? Uh, I was thinking of Chamber Street. So it's really from Chamber Street to 14th Street. And James Delancey was a loyalist. And so his land was confiscated in 1777, sold off uh, during uh, the uh, post-revolutionary period uh, and created into kind of a working class slum akin to what was happening with the Trinity Church farm on the west side. And there were speculators that bought it, carved it up into small lots. The difference between the Trinity Church farm on the west side and uh, the Delancey farm, uh, as it was known, uh, was that the latter uh, had a lot of low-lying ground. The Collect Pond, which was a freshwater pond uh, just north of Chamber Street, became so polluted by the first decade of the 19th century uh, that the city ordered it filled in. But land which is based upon filled in uh, rivers and lake runs is never really that solid. And so as a result, this slum, uh, which centers around the five points, a meeting of a number of streets, Tyler Anbinder probably spoke about that with you, it's a, it's a, a notorious slum, okay, uh, was reserved really for the poorest of poor New Yorkers. Okay, uh, and it was an area in which people who were unfortunate enough to live down the cellar oftentimes had to live and sleep within rising water, which could even come up to their bed and force them out. And of course, then gave them uh, made them vulnerable to all kinds of vermin uh, and, and, and to diseases. Okay, so uh, what I'm arguing is that even in this rather poor spot, even in an area where there were tensions over work, okay, even when an area where uh, one group, the Irish are trying to scrape out a new existence coming out of a literal Holocaust in their home country, uh, into New York City, where they had the advantage of politics. And the Irish Democratic Party adopting them in the 1830s were naturalizing Irish very, very quickly and giving them the vote, something that African-Americans lacked because of a clause passed in the 1821 con uh, Constitution, New York State Constitution, which declared that African-Americans who were eligible to vote had to post a $250 bond in order to do so. And this is a sizable amount of money. And it cut the plebiscite of African-Americans in New York and elsewhere uh, from a couple thousand able to influence elections in the first couple of decades down to almost nothing. And this is a major plank in civil rights agitation for African-Americans from the 1820s right up until uh, the uh, the 14th Amendment uh, and, and 15th Amendment after the revolution. So this is an area again where there, there could be some, some, some contest. But what I found is that everyday life was different and it had kind of a spontaneous communitas, which uh, Victor Tyner, her, Turner, this anthropologist says, daily relationships shaping their lives, adding symbolic meaning to just ordinary demographics of, of, of what people were doing. Okay. And then oftentimes people were working together, uh, living together, even, even married. Okay. Uh, and by de-emphasizing the industrial occupations and focusing rather on laborers and domestics, most of whom were female, uh, and the city licensed semi-laced war yearners, I mentioned carters, porters, grocers, tavern keepers, butchers, junk and rag dealers, even by the way, stockbrokers who were listed among this, this, this area, uh, and then the useless trades of prostitution and petty criminals, okay, that we can begin to see that there's a lot of uh, commonality. Okay? Um, and most laborers had only a tenuous relationship with the skill trades in New York City. Gradually, the craft skills are declining. Sean Wilentz in his famous book, uh, uh, Sean's Democratic, uh, talks about artisan republicanism uh, in. Uh, uh, New York City and how it's being replaced by uh, the uh, industrialization, beginning with cabinet making and shoe making, but other trades as well. And so that what were craft workers more and more become simply wage earners. Okay? Gradually, this people begin to try to form their own unions, not very successfully. 
Okay. There's a big movement, of course, of the local FOCO to try to break up license monopolies and to try to give the right to make a living to every man. But that also is more absorbed in the, Republic, in the Democratic Party than anything else. Okay. Now, uh, Hasid Diner pointed out a long time ago, something that people often don't realize, and that is that the majority of Irish immigrants to New York City in the antebellum period and afterwards were Irish women and okay, not men. Okay. Uh, and that by 1855, Irish females had supplanted black females uh, as the domestics. And today, perhaps as well, maybe it's come back a little bit more now, but for a long time, uh, the presence of a live in domestic in one's house has been pretty rare in the 20th and 21st century. Okay. Perhaps now with uh, the widening wage. Uh, and an income gap is become, coming back. Okay? Uh, but uh, Irish women uh, were very common workers as domestics. Many black women, uh, especially right after slavery is fully abolished in New York state in 1827, began to quit their work, began to move from employer to employer, demanding higher wages. And I think that this uh, resistant and challenging behavior was, it was too much for many, many Middle class uh, New Yorkers. Okay. Another area where we find a lot of commingling um, are working as hotel maids, waitresses, and cooks, uh, housekeepers, washerwomen, boarding women. Uh, both black and uh, Irish women were, were, were boarders. Okay. Uh, but again, the domestic work uh, over 30% of Irish females over the age of 50 in the Sixth Ward work a, 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 as domestics. Okay. So during the antebellum period, um, about 1845, the proportion of Irish and African-Americans in the population of Sixth Ward is about equal. Okay? Uh, both were about 44% of the, of the, of the, of the okay? Irish begin to soar in population, Blacks begin to move out, especially after the 1834 riots. Okay? Um, but even so, the numbers did not increase dramatically be up to a zenith of 25,855 and fall back to 21,870, okay? That's as other groups begin to appear, uh, Chinese, uh, Italians, uh, some Jews, or Germans who begin to create an area called Kleine Deutschland, uh, just north of, of the sixth board, okay? Um, and so it's really much of a shared neighborhood. And again, one where uh, personal contact, work experience, everyday life leads to a greater familiarity uh, and oftentimes uh, to living together, okay? Uh, so right around this area, uh, there's, there's a movement. New York is very different in those periods. It's not as segregated as it becomes later. In the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, it's not as segregated according to income or, or, or by class, okay? Uh, so just the South Board is City Hall. Okay, so that's really only a, a couple hundred feet away from, from the five points. To the west is Broadway, which was the most important avenue in America. Have you seen Broadway, sir? All New Yorkers would say to visitors, go gone there and checked it out. That's where all the big stores are, the best houses. Okay, it's where the Broadway Tabernacle was. It was a place of just uh, great fascination. Akin perhaps to what Fifth Avenue has been, perhaps Madison Avenue is uh, to the present. Okay, uh, to the west, uh, and then Broadway, and then beyond that, uh, the Eighth Ward, which is again a commingling of African Americans and oftentimes very wealthy New Yorkers as well. Uh, David Ruggles, whom I later wrote a book on, uh, lived on Lisbernard Street, and very close to him lived the mayor. Okay, uh, some of his uh, major patrons in the, uh, the uh, Anti Slavery Vigilance Committee. Uh, live very close by to him. Okay, so again, the commingling of peoples in this lower Manhattan is, is, is really quite striking uh, in the antebellum period. And Ruggles knew a lot of these people and counted on them for donations to his movement uh, and for support when he got into the constant trouble that he found himself into. Okay, now to the west, of course, is the Bowery. Uh, and this is uh, the area of oyster houses, taverns, and the working class theaters which create the melodrama 
uh, and the minstrel trios, which were very important in the 19th century. And this, I think, is the area, well, certainly is the area that inspires uh, Martin Scorsese's movie, uh, The Gangs of New York, uh, which I think also expresses the kind of popular racism, uh, which I find a little bit disconcerting uh, and something where I, I think is perhaps overblown and that Scorsese could have used a little further look, certainly at Tyler Ann Binder's book and some of my work as well. Okay, uh, But that's an area, of course, where there's a growing Irish and German middle class and eventually a, a Jewish class as well. Okay, uh, is where you have the Bowery Theater. Okay. Right in the middle of all of this then is this carnivalesque five points, which both excites and more, uh, appalls moralistic uh, New Yorkers. This triangular paradise square, which is the center of the five points is located about a fifth mile from, uh, uh, from uh, City Hall. This is where Little Water, Cross, Anthony Orange and Mulberry Streets enter like rivers emptying themselves into a bay. Okay. And this is where George Foster, but earlier people like Charles Dickens would come down in the evening to gape, uh, to act as early flaneurs to see what was happening in these uh, boarding houses, grocery stores, and houses of prostitution. Okay? Uh, Foster first drew attention to the old brewery, which was erected in 1797, and created kind of as, as a slum uh, in 1837 crammed several hundred black and Irish men and women. Okay? Uh, and this, of course, is a very well-known house of prostitution. Okay? Uh, and crowd around the brewery uh, were taverns, oyster cellars, uh, groceries. And in those days, uh, grocers sold primarily alcohol. Uh, while they did sell things like uh, cheeses and vegetables, bread, their primary income uh, was alcohol. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons there were so many in there were not licensed. A, uh, and the patrons of these places, according to Foster, were mostly sailors, Negroes, and the worst of loafers and vagabonds. A, and he said that every ta tavern, every saloon employed a black fiddler ready to tune up his villainous squeaking for a sixpence apiece and a treat at the end. Uh, one of the most remarkable comments about this comes from the mid 20th century professor of music at Harvard, Eileen Southern. Okay? Uh, and she was a wonderful writer uh, and argued that the five points presaged, presaged a grand American opera. Okay? This is really where we see the origins of jazz from these Irish and black fiddlers, dancers, uh, and musicians are playing together. According to Foster, the brothels employed young rural women, which is largely true, okay, uh, who came to the city desperate for something in their hearts. Okay, uh, really, these middle-class tourists found these vices altogether. Again, when I mentioned uh, Peter Williams' dance hall, which is immortalized by uh, Charles Dickens, becomes a successful tourist attraction. And this is where we also get the 20th century phenomenon of slumming, okay, of middle-class uh, observers coming down to the Five Points to look at Irish and, 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 and Blacks uh, drinking, gambling, uh, making love, making music, presaging that grand American opera. Okay. Uh, the greatest concentrations, concentrations of Blacks and Irish lived along Cross Street. Uh, between Augustus and Duane in the part, part of the Five Points. Uh, they still existed 30 years later. Okay. Uh, and what I did in order to create the study uh, is that to look at the city directories. Uh, and during the 19th century, uh, very commonly every year, there were directories listing every resident of the city or nearly everyone. Okay. And so this not only included very famous people uh, like uh, Philip Hone, okay, uh, but also just very ordinary people like George Washington, who was an African-American living along Cross Street. Okay? Uh, and there would also be advertisements in here, but eventually this, you could have list every single New Yorker. So I looked at those and while they were alphabetized by examining 
who lived on a particular street, I was able to identify quite a number of people, Black and Irish, who, who lived together. Okay, so uh, along this uh, street, um, on Orange Street, uh, we can find uh, Gilbert Palmer, uh, who is an Irish liquor dealer. dealer. Then Levi Marks, who is a uh, Jewish uh, used clothing dealer. Then Anaste Plitt, who was a black barber from Trinidad. And his neighbor was Edward McDaniel, an Irish shoemaker, okay? followed by Harry Matthews, who's a black porter from, from Maryland, okay? likely someone who came up through the Underground Railroad. Okay? And such random ethnicity continues through the principal streets of, of, of the war. Okay? Uh, and, and then later on, we get people like uh, John DeVos, who's another uh, uh, a writer about this, talking about after dark of gangs of Negroes, Irish, and sailors standing around discussing matters uh, in their their line of conversation. Okay, so unrelated blacks and Irish are living together in the nineteenth century. Okay, uh, and this is different from the eighteenth century when most blacks living with a white probably were the servants. Uh, you can find this, for example, very heavily in the first and second wards. Uh, around the time of the revolution where uh, George Washington set up residence during 1789 where Alexander Hamilton lives with many wealthy New Yorkers. Those people had black servants, okay? But this is different. These are poor black and, and Irish and Jews and later Germans, okay? Living and working together, spending time together. They're not fighting each other all the time. They're not rioting against each other. They're just living their lives. And I think this is, Really, really important. Okay, uh, so there we get you know couples like George Washington, I mentioned a moment ago, one of the three black men in the city named after the first president, living with his black wife Adelaide, another black woman Harriet Moses, and then someone living in their home as a boarder, an Irish woman named Joanna Cosgrove, okay, uh, who simply lived with them. Okay, and then we see Moses Downing, a forty-three-year-old black musician renting space in his home to James and Mary Gallagher, an Irish printer and his wife. Again, the census gives us this and also the, um, the city directories. It's just by going back and, and looking at these things much more closely to get a granular look at what the city residents were like, okay, uh, creates a better understanding of this. Okay, uh, you can also see some of this in the House of Refuge where uh, Irish and African-American teenage boys and girls who could be sent into the home for almost any reason, okay, some kind of petty crime, okay, uh, and then were bound out together. So they would work, work, work together, okay. Boys would be sent to work on farms or the sea. Girls were invariably sent into service and domestic work, okay. Their lives seldom improved, but nonetheless, they lived together, okay, and they worked together, okay. And as adults, okay, uh, they suffered from uh, implacable hands of charity and correction. Uh, the Five Points Mission uh, House, and again, Taylor Ann Bander's book is, is critical for understanding this, tears down the old ball ring in 1851, offers shelter and hope from forms of schools and, and references, okay? uh, but again, it's with a cost. Okay? Uh, but Irish and Black New Yorkers are living in these places. They also live together in the almshouse population, okay? where poverty produced crime. Uh, they also live in the city's uh, 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 first hospitals where they suffer from tuberculosis, pleurisy, pneumonia, and hemorrhaging. Earlier I was making, uh, uh, showing kind of a enjoyable side of life, but there's also very troubling parts of life and poverty does uh, uh, get a disease. Okay. Uh, they also, to at least to outsiders, uh, Irish uh, in five points, uh, epitomize crime. Okay. Now, New York didn't have many murders. Uh, there were uh, only 13 between uh, 1838 and 1851. Okay. But increases were blamed upon conditions in, in the five points uh, and upon the, the Irish. Um, and sometimes these fist fights were diverted into riots, particularly the 1834 riots uh, and then 1847. Okay. Uh, and these were times when there would be animosity towards Irish and African Americans. But what I'm saying to you is that while that was happening, there were also these everyday things. 
We must not also not forget the uh, importance of the media here. Uh, the New York Sun, which is the first penny dreadful, uh, the first penny press of 1834, uh, blames other newspapers for the riot, particularly, again, these newspapers in these days are openly partisan. Okay? So the Courier and Enquirer, which were Democratic papers, the commercial advertiser, which was the Whig paper, later becoming a Republican, okay? saying that they allow for the spirit of riot to, to remain re respectable. Okay. And what's interesting, too, is that the Sun compares the riot uh, against African Americans in 1834 with a similar riot against Irish in 1835. Okay. So that reflects a kind of mutual insecurity. Okay. Uh, and that the rioters attack uh, Blacks really because a newspaper incited them to. Okay. Uh, so uh, Blacks had their own grievances. Uh, Irish had their own, their own grievances particularly that of, of uh, Blacks who are working towards abolitionism. And this is something, as uh, James Horton argued, again, that to, to be a Black man in New York City in the 1830s, you really had to be an abolitionist. And it, was, it was really something of, of, of manliness. And that's something I think that the Irish respected. I think it's something that they, 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 they shared. And it was kind of a, a common thing. Okay. Gilbert Vale, uh, who was an equal rights editor of the Diamond, promotes this, this kind of opposition to slavery. Vail, by the way, later on, is the editor and publisher of the Journal of Peace uh, narrative in, in 1850. Okay. Uh, really, Irish Americans had very little to fear from Black politics because Blacks were fairly weak. They didn't have the vote. They wouldn't, money, they didn't, down to the 1850s of that $250 bond, uh, they become less less powerful. And of course, it's not until after the Civil War they get the full vote. Okay, uh, but this really in these areas of we see of, of licensed work, okay, of, of horse firing, okay, and this happens interestingly enough because of a change in the Democratic Party. Earlier, I mentioned uh, the uh, local focal movement. This movement wanted to abolish licensing, which they said was a relic of English tyranny. Okay. Most licensed tradesmen, of course, didn't want that to happen because they didn't want their trade open to everyone. But gradually it does happen. And by the 1840s, okay, licensed carters are able to horse hire their carts, uh, employing day laborers as drivers and begin to hire, and most of these are Irish carters, begin to hire African-Americans as their laborers. So this reform is beginning to open up this ancient trade uh, racially. And the same thing happens with grossing and among butchers as well. That term horse hiring may be familiar. It's actually the term that was used in 1979 when uh, the New York City government decided that it was going to allow taxi drivers to horse hire uh, for the first time uh, in the 20th century. And coincidental to that was the transformation of uh, cab driving in from an almost entirely white trade into one generally manned by first Russian Jews, African immigrants, particularly from Nigeria, the first large scale immigrants since the end of the slave trade in 1807, and then eventually uh, South Asian, Pakistanis, Bangladeshi, and Indian drivers uh, who now dominate the trade, okay? Very few of whom own, own a medallion. But it's interesting to see how there's kind of a parallel integration between what happens in the 1840s and what happens in the 20th, late 20th century, okay? Uh, and so by the 1850s, we do see black carters in the census. Interestingly enough, again, someone who is generally derided uh, as deeply racist, Fernando Wood, who even uh, in 1859 proposed that New York City should secede from the Union and join the Confederacy. He is the first man to license uh, Black Carters uh, earlier on. Okay? Uh, and by 1900, there are about 1,400 Blacks who are driving public carts. Okay? And they continue to do so uh, and sort of in a segregated way uh, as taxi drivers in the 20th century. Okay. Uh, so all of these trades, uh, which Irish and, and Black share, gradually move, move on up. Okay. Um, it's also the case for, for, for domestics. 
a, a job that has very few rewards, very bad pay. Domestics usually work six and a half days a week, and they would work maybe perhaps for five dollars a month. I mean, it's, only, it's very akin to play. Okay? Plus, they would always, as Betsy Blackmar pointed out in her masterful book, a Manhattan for Rent. Uh, be vulnerable to the depredations of uh, the master of the house and, and, and was that the ensuing enmity of, of, of the lady of the house okay but they did it okay and they preferred that probably to living in poverty because at least they were living in middle class houses but this is something that has a lot of uh, over uh, turnover uh, and both blacks and irish uh, did that um a lot of these people wound up eventually committing crime uh, the census for the tombs in 1860, because they did count the number of people who were in the, uh, the, the jail. Okay? Uh, Irish prostitutes, the greatest perpetrators of minor crimes like intoxication, uh, public lewdness, petty larceny, pauperism. Okay? Uh, but there also were large numbers of, of Black women in there serving the same thing. And 60 years later, W. E. Du Bois, one of his masterful statements, argued that at the bottom of society, there's always integration. And perhaps that's something we can, we, we can find here. But it's also the case that a little bit higher up, uh, Black New Yorkers and Irish New Yorkers were, were commingling. They also create a kind of a conversation. You mentioned before, the speaking in their, in their own tones, a kind of a flash talk. And I recommend the wonderful work that, work that Timothy Guilfoyle has done on that. Okay, uh, going the rounds around a benderman and going on a drinking spree. Okay, uh, professional thieves were known as crossmen. Burglars were known as crackmen who were on the dub or to crack a can or break into a house. Okay. Uh, and Anthony Street between center points, the five points was Cat Hollow because of all the prostitutes. Little Water, which is the southern edge of Paradise Square, occupied by two black and two Irish taverns is called Dandy Lane. And this kind of vernacular again is shared by the Irish uh, and, and black. And it's really that, you know, the ta ta tavern life that where this happens in, in particular. Okay, uh, now, one of the biggest areas of anxiety for white supremacy in America in the 19th century was what they called amalgamation, uh, what we now know as interracial or love or mixed race love. Okay, uh, and this is something you know that happened a lot in the Bardello. In fact, the boys was right. This happens at the, at the very bottom of society. Okay, but it also is the case that people were just living together. Okay, uh, and there were a few brave Irish who defied social sanctions, married Blacks, okay? uh, and we see mixed couples appearing regularly in the six wards, rectories, and in the census. Uh, Peter Williams, a 53-year-old uh, Danish seaman, lived openly with his wife, Deborah, a Black woman from Maryland. William Moore, a Black male laborer, married an Irish woman, Winifred. They lived in a 12-year-old son and a three-year-old daughter at 228 Mulberry Street, just north of the five, five points. Okay. Perhaps the bravest is John Baker, a black carter married to an Irish woman named Julia. And of course, he would face opposition in the street while living in a marriage which could promote assault from, from thugs. But these people did it and they lived their lives. Okay. And in 1860, 10 years after the Fugitive Slave Act, which sent hundreds of New York, black New Yorkers fleeing to Canada, Stephen Saunders, a black chimney sweep uh, from Virginia, his white wife Mary from Ireland, hosted assorted boarders from Germany, Ireland, and New York City. One home sheltered two interracial couples. John de Poister, a black laborer, and his wife Bridget, shared a house with John Francis from Virginia and his Irish wife, Susan. So what I'm suggesting to you is that while we have in popular culture uh, and the gangs of New York, uh, a very important book by Herbert Asbury and still in print, uh, which Luke Sante has also uh, updated in one of his works, but also in, in, in historical discourse as well. Uh, while those views look upon Irish and Blacks as, as, as implacable, what I've tried to suggest to you today is you know, that there were, that they oftentimes, while they competed economically and looked closely together, they coexisted peacefully. There were riots, 44, 47, 57, and 1863 very famously, but there were also many, many years in which they just lived together. Okay? Uh, and they lived together in a, a difficult, tough urban slum. Okay? Uh, and you know, this is something where I think you know, where they, that, that proximity 
allow them to continue life on a quotidian friendly basis and offers to us uh, a, a model uh, for which we can understand more our society, uh, a society which looks more like America and less like one which was rigorously segregated like the 20th century from which we are, are still uh, trying to emerge ourselves. So uh, that's my presentation. I, I hope you enjoyed it. And if there anybody here who wants any questions, well, I'm open to them. Thank you. Great, that was fantastic, Graham. And um, yeah, anyone who's on our the Zoom talk, you might have to use the Q and A feature here down low um, to type. Sometimes chat is not enabled. I don't know why in a webinar. Um, it's beyond my <laughs> beyond mine. So I took a few notes, Graham, and I did. You know, I I thought your um your analysis there, which you just recapped at the end, it it seems that it is the proximity that kind of instead of familiarity breeding contempt actually breeding cooperation and you know peace in a way that it was the Irish who moved out of that area and uptown because that was the fascinating thing particularly about the the um draft riots in 1863 like none really of the damage was done in five points you know they, they're attacking Brooks Brothers stores and the newspapers but apparently some of the people who were attacked down in five points were the mixed race families and yes. so it isn't themselves that are uprising, like it's this other, and you know, I will say the Irish get the blame when we know it was working class New Yorkers, German New Yorkers, like it wasn't just Irish, you know, it was a it was a push against the, the draft, the conscription, as much as it was race, surely. Oh, that's really the case for 1863. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, James Horton has written very eloquently about that whole issue of proximity and separation. I, I think he's right about that. If, you know, people do live with amidst each other yeah they will learn to cooperate you know? yeah uh, you can't have riots and stabbings every single day yeah um and also people get to know each other uh i think for example you, uh, this is ancillary to what we're talking about here but this is where you see something incredible happening to the in present day flushing mm. uh where asians from china vietnam korea the philippines Okay. living together, studying mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. their children forming relationships, they're really becoming Asian American, are really becoming Americans. Mm -hmm. okay. And I don't think it's too big a jump to say that similar kinds of things were happening in New York City before the Civil War. Yeah. Okay. You didn't have the kind of schools and facilities that exist in Flushing. Um, but there were shared entrepreneurial efforts. Uh, there were shared, shared housing, just street life. The other thing, too, you, you're quite right that the Irish do get a heavy blame for 1863, but you know there are other aspects of this. Um, Leonard Richard's wonderful book, Gentlemen of Property and Standing, uh, demonstrated by as far back as 1834 that oftentimes you find middle and upper middle class guys fighting in these riots. Mm -hmm. okay, and they were doing it for, for political reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was certainly the case uh, in the later riots as well. Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, your analysis, I, I was saying to everybody, um, I love that essay, the, the companionable, um, agreeable companions. What's it? Is it in New York Irish? I, I keep mixing yeah, up the two. In, yeah. It's in New York Irish. And then later I reprinted it in uh, a book of mine called Slavery, Freedom and Culture, which has a lot of my, my essays up to that point. Okay, perfect. So, you know, I would recommend and thank you for listing out all these other books. I know a lot of the times our members like to hear, you know, reading recommendations. But both you and Tyler Anbinder, who we actually had on last year, he was talking about the famine era, Irish immigrants who moved to New York. Yeah. I think what a lot of other historians and what you have missed, which you two guys do so well, is complicate the story of five points and, and that whole area. You know, like there's, there is upward mobility, like there are more than just drunks you know falling apart or, or gang members rioting every day like there are thriving little communities down there and that's where some of that neighborliness and you know where you get to see that oh they're humans too and our music is very similar or we dance in ways that are compatible or you know whatever little similarities they had in common yes i i, I hope that we get that back in our cities today I mean, yeah, help yeah. Out, uh, to get away from uh the segregation of the suburbs that Kenneth Jackson so ably described uh, in his Crabgrass Frontiers. Yeah, that's an amazing book. Mm -hmm. yeah.
crabgrass won't hear everyone just in case you didn't hear that yeah so you know i i am it's amazing though the pr you know negative job that has been done on you know both the irish and the the free as they were then in 1827 free black people poor people immigrants right from the start like that you know five points really was one of these places you know that as even charles dickens writes so horribly about it you know and there's almost a, a, a well there, there's no almost about it. there's a complete stigmatization of them they're not really even seen as human you know the fact that they're living in these basements well, they, and, they certainly weren't at the time but i mean the, the class yeah. bias them I mean, was just it was just and know, the religion was, bias maybe too you know against the catholics yeah well yeah i mean a mm -hmm. uh, long time ago dale noble pointed out that most of the cartoons that were published in leslie's and uh, Harper's Weekly in the 1850s, uh, Irish and Black shared very denigrating physiognomies. Yeah. Uh, they were always pointing them out, the two of them as, you know, being subhuman. Simeon, yeah. 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 So, I mean, later on, of course, Irish gained political power, and that's the big advantage they have over Blacks. Big, big yeah. advantage. Uh, and that leads, of course, uh, to greater prosperity. Yeah. So. And am I right, Graham, in thinking that a lot of the Black people actually kind of fled Manhattan after the draft riots in particular well, or yes and no um i mean yeah. a number of them do of course well mm -hmm. that's the drive well that's that's an argument that ivor bernstein's put out but actually if you look at mm -hmm. the 1865 census they're back okay uh, they have so only temporary yeah. uh the union league which now is this you know very elite um, club uh mm -hmm. was founded to create support for the union and to they the union league sponsored uh, the 54th Regiment went to march through Manhattan mm. uh, right after the draft riot. So that was a very important moment to say, you know, we're back. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is our city. Uh, what does happen is that the Black population, and this has been going on for decades before that, it stagnates compared to uh, the immigrant population, but notably the Irish, but later on uh, Jews, mm -hmm. Uh, Asians and, and Italians, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so Poles and Germans, uh, you know, they, they're, their percentages are just tiny. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will remain true until the 1890s uh, when the uh, Great Migration occurs and transforms New York City into being what it was until very recently, the largest per capita Black city in America. Not mm -hmm. Chicago, not Atlanta, mm -hmm. okay, uh, New York City. Mm -hmm. But and, uh, yeah, again, they, they, the, you know, the, the political power has been missing into, again until fairly recently. Mm -hmm. And now it's somewhat shared. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we now have a black mayor, a second black mayor. And, mm -hmm. uh, whether he represents real blackness, well, it has to be discussed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he, he seems to be a very business minded guy. I uh, know, yeah. The, the New York mayors don't get an easy time of it, <laughs> you know, no yeah, matter who they're supposed to represent. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. I just there was an article last week in the New York Times, I think, about you know black people fleeing the city for maybe suburbs and other places because this post-COVID kind of I, I don't know what's going on down there. But well, there is, you know, there is animosity. Uh, you know, yeah. racial animosity has increased. Um, yeah, we'll see how that long that lasts because okay. the South is no great place either these days. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a very difficult environment. It absolutely uh, is. Yeah, and we have so problems ourselves here in that. Albany. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we go through these uh, periods. It's, history doesn't repeat itself, but, you know, we do have similarities, mm -hmm. but with complexity. And I think mm -hmm. that's something mm -hmm. to take a look at for antebellum Irish and Blacks. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, I, we must try and get your book in store here so that people can order it if they'd like. I'm sure it's available on Amazon, though. Uh, if the worst comes uh, to the worst. Yeah, well, I think that they might, they want to get my more recent views. Look at my book on David Ruggles. Okay. available. Uh, mm -hmm. Black New Jersey, which came out in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, well, those are more recent views, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think, you know, as I said, anything that kind of complicates the story, because we've had Tyler Ambinger and Lenny Sloan talking about the cooperation and the the mixing, but, you know, there there is a lot to be said for that area and, and this era, you know, where there's just normal people going about their lives, you know, and what you're saying about the labor I thought was very interesting too. We tend to think about, you know, Terence Powderly and Knights mm -hmm. of Labour not allowing other people into the unions, but actually, you know, they weren't the only workers. And so when you look at it that way, you know, it's it's a uh, maybe well, it's a know, where story. it also happens. And I didn't get into this uh, in my my talk, but I, I think it's it's there. You can check out uh, America's historic newspapers or New York State newspapers, mm -hmm. and 
after African Americans gained the vote mm. uh, with the 15th Amendment, African American males, uh, you know, they began more political clout. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in many ways, they are tied to the Republican Party, which was the party of Lincoln. Okay? And anybody who looks at this has realized that the party of Lincoln, the Republican Party, and the Democratic Party totally flips positions after the Civil Rights Act of 1865. But going back to the 19th century, um, African Americans are not entirely comfortable with being sort of the stepchildren of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. So they would periodically reach out to the Irish who were largely in the Democratic Party and talk about coalitions. And you can find instances of this in the 1870s and 1880s where you know, they're really trying to create some kind of leverage together. Mm -hmm. uh, because the Irish in the latter part of the 19th century had lower level positions and they're beginning to get uh, more important positions like the mayorality in the 1870s. Mm -hmm. but it's not like they will have in the 20th century. Uh, so these are two groups which are still searching for means to power and greater leverage. And there, there are at least some attempts to, 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 to help out. That changes a lot after Plessy versus Ferguson and the institution of, of uh, segregation in the 20th century. Okay. Okay, well, uh, this has been fascinating. I, uh, if anyone, you don't, you haven't typed a question yet, I don't want to cut anyone off, you know, if they have a question to ask, but absolutely fascinating stuff. And I think um, we're probably going to return to this topic. You know, it, it would be an interesting one to track into the 20th century. Yeah. Although I have a feeling, you know, that um, there may not be as much cooperation. Oh, good, we have one. But said, thank you so much for an enlightening presentation. My pleasure. Glad to work with you. And you guys are doing great things up there. Yeah, thank you very much. We're trying, you know. And um, keep an eye, everyone, for our next event is on next week. Friday, we'll accept the, the breads, the soda breads and the porter cakes for our competition. And then Saturday, we have our run and a concert afterwards with the Good Morning Nags, which we're very excited about. That's going to be out on Quackenbush Square. And then, of course, your newsletter will be going out tonight with full steam uh, of events for March. We're, we're, uh, it's always the high holy month, Graham. You know, too much, too much work, <laughs> but everyone remembers their Irish uh, in March. So we're looking forward to celebrating our Irish American heritage. And thank you so much, Dr. Hodges. We'll definitely have you back. Uh, as I say, if anyone wants to check in, I wrote down most of the names of the books that he recommended, and we certainly will either get his book in books in, or you can order them on Amazon. But thank you very much, everyone, Thanks and uh, have a great night. Keep up thank the good you. work. Right, thank bye -bye. you. <laughs> Take care. Bye bye.